Hey, so uh, thanks to uh, Zach and to um, to Bro and uh, and Doug too. They all invited me up here to uh, to speak to you guys today. So I'm I'm very blessed by that. And like we were mentioned, I'm the men's director for the core ministry at, at the Orchard. And for those of you who showed up on Saturday and brought your your gear and all that, I really appreciate that. It was uh, made it a very special event. So. Never want to enter into God's Word without praying, so if you would all bow your hearts with me as we offer this time to the Lord. <sighs> Father, you are so good and gracious, and we look to you for our strength. We look to you to bless us, not only with this, uh, this food that nourished our bodies, but now with this spiritual food. So I pray that the Spirit of God would come upon me now as I endeavor to teach the men. It may be, Lord, that we grow in the grace and the knowledge of you, Lord Jesus, and we leave this place today different than how we entered in. I pray all this in Jesus' name, and everyone says, Amen. 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 So I, uh, I remember talking to, uh, to Doug and to Zach and that uh, I was invited to come to No Men Left Behind. And I, I, love, I love that that's the name of this ministry. Um, and I don't know if it came out of, I didn't get a chance to ask him, I don't know if it came out of the idea that uh, in the service you, you don't leave any man behind right on the battlefield. Or if it came from uh, first responders, that you're not going to see a first responder leave anyone behind either. But in either case, I love that that's the name of the, the ministry, No Man Left Behind. So I'm fond of saying that this is a battleground and it's not a playground. Amen. And I'm concerned that sometimes some of us men think that this is some kind of playground and we're going to get on our boats and our bikes and just go have a good time where Zach was just saying today that he has his bike as a tool so he can minister to those folks that would connect with that kind of a thing because he's the prince in the power of the air right and so he's in charge at this time the Lord allows that right now and he's the ruler of this age and so it's a battleground guys and we got to take it seriously because we're behind enemy, enemy lines is the other part of it. Amen. And we're not going to leave anybody behind. We're not going to leave any man behind. And uh, I'm so grateful that the church ha had asked me to be the, the men's director because I think this is my calling. I think the, the Lord has called me to men's ministry. I've been involved in recovery ministry and all kinds of other things. Youth ministry and, and young adults and, and children's ministry have done a lot of different things. But for some reason, this resonates. You ever get into your, your sweet spot and it resonates with you? Well, charge after that. Don't just allow that, that Holy Spirit calling to go, no, 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 that's not my thing. You charge after it, and you make a difference for the Lord. And it's not you doing it, right? It's the Spirit working through us to do that. So once again, I just want to thank everybody. So when I thought about this No Man Left Behind, uh, that you guys asked me to come here, it drew me to the verses in Luke. So if you have your Bibles, we'll be in Luke chapter 14 and 15. Um, and I shall be mindful of the time. So, in Luke chapter 14, if you're there, some of you are working on your $800 Bibles there. I have, I have an old school paper one. Is that still allowed? Can I still bring that in here? Yeah. Luke chapter 14, we find Jesus. He is in the house of a Pharisee. And he's there and he's... he's going to begin to talk to these Pharisees and draw their attention to some things that are going on. And he heals a man with the dropsy and, and uh, starts talking to them about healing and should it be done on the Sabbath day and what's going on with that. And he's challenging the leadership of that day on what it means to, to minister to those that are lost, minister to those that are uh, in need of not only physical healing but spiritual healing as well. As he goes on there, verses 7 through 14, he begins to talk to them about how to take the lowly place. When, you, when you're going to some kind of a celebration, how to take the lowly place. Or if you're giving the celebration, how to bring those low ones up to the, the places of privilege. So he's speaking to them. And you can just imagine, for those of you who know a little bit about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, these were very rich men who liked their position, who liked to be recognized when they went out, when they went to dinner, that they got the high places and all that, and they liked all those things. 
And they, you know, I'm sure in their minds they thought, you know, I worked very hard. I spent years and years in rabbinical school to get where I'm at now, and certainly I deserve everything that I've, I've done to have this high place, and I pray that's not our hearts either. So that's a challenge for us already. Don't let your education or your knowledge or your experience or how you've elevated in a ministry make you think that you've earned some special place in there. Remain a servant, right? Jesus did not come to be served but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. And that's, I think, what Jesus is starting to challenge with these Pharisees and the Sadducees. And he goes on and talks about this parable of the Great Supper. And he's talking about Israel, and he's like, you know, invite them in, and none of them wanted to come in, and they all had all these different excuses. Well, I've got to go take care of my land. I've got to take care of my, my dad. I've got to do all these things. And for those of you who shared or witnessed with people before, isn't that what we get, excuses? I, I, don't, I don't have time. I'm busy. I'm busy. I, I got this stuff. Do you know? I got, I got uh, my work, and I got this, and I that. You don't have time to go to church, an hour on a Sunday, just to show up at church and, and be part of that, or to come to to a men's breakfast and hang out with the brothers and, and be fed uh, by the word of God. So, you hit those excuses, and Christ was coming across those with these these folks, and he says, well, you know what? Never mind. They don't want to come in. Go out and get everybody, anybody who wants to come, have them come in. And I think that's what I love about. Winger's ministry and this ministry here and hopefully at the core as well that anybody can come there. I don't care if you know Christ or you don't know Christ. Come in and be fed and receive the word and know healing and find purpose in your life and be able to do those things. So I love that Christ did that on, on the supper. And then he gets to this part that I think some people struggle with about having to leave all to follow Christ. And he talks about in chapter 14, verse 26, If anyone comes to me and does not, listen to this word, hate his father, his mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, yes, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And this is really hard for some people to hear. So i got to hate my dad? No, 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 no. Because it goes on to the next verse to say, And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. I think Jesus is trying to tell us, Take my relationship with you serious. And I get very serious when I get an opportunity to share the Word of God because I take the Bible very seriously too. Because it guides my life. I pray that it guides your life as well. That when you have a, a decision to make, that you're turning to the, the Scriptures to see what, what God is trying to tell you about children and money and wives and, and, and position and a decision in your life that you search the Scriptures daily so you can know what it is that you, God's calling you to do to make that decision. Because that's what, that's what Jesus is saying here in that part of Scripture. Take your relationship with me seriously. And I'm stressing this because I pray that you can sense my seriousness about teaching the men here today that we all take our relationship serious. So here he is before the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He's done all these things. And we're going to sum it up where we're going to start here today in chapter 14, verse 34. After saying all these things to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he says this, salt is good. And it's sitting on your tables right now, right? How many of you salted your eggs today? I could not eat my, yeah. I had my eggs over easy. i got to get some salt in that yolk because it's not good without the salt. Salt is good. Salt is good. So Jesus gets done telling all those stories, and he gets to this part where he says salt is good, and that resonated with those people of that time. The salt had value, and it was good. So when he said that, they're like, oh yeah, salt, salt is good. But then he goes on further in the verse to say this, but if salt has lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor for the dunghill, but men throw it out. And here, I like this one, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And that's the condition of your heart, that hearing. It also shows up in Revelation, right? He who has ears. Do you guys have ears today? I pray already that the Spirit of God is moving in this room and you're having a sense for something is happening. Because I love that the Bible says that the, it's the Spirit that guides us in all truth. So for those of you who are concerned about coming up here and sharing the Word of God, you don't have to worry about that because it's the Spirit that guides in all truth. And that's who's teaching me and teaching all of us today. The Spirit's at work in this room already. So what is the condition of your heart? If you are in your Word daily, and if you are in prayer daily, and if you are guiding your family daily in the ways of Christ, your heart condition is soft, right? Washed in the wa water of the Word. That water, when it hits clay, it softens it as well. So keep your heart soft. So salt is good. 
In Jesus' day, the soldiers were paid in salt. Did you guys know that? They got a few coins. They got a few silver coins they got paid with. But they also received a bag of salt as well. And this was payment because it had value at that time. There was value to the salt. Um, the word in the Greek is salarium. This is where we get our word salary. Makes sense, right? So salary comes from that. So there's value to the salt. I got a few... Uh, uh, sayings you may have heard of before. Have you ever heard this one before? This guy is not worth his salt. Have you ever heard that before? And maybe us gray hair guys remember that a little bit more than the younger guys in here. Hey, 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 I got it too. Come on now. <laughs> that guy's not worth his salt. Man, I, I counted on him to show up. We're going to pick on Joe, right? I counted on him to, to show up and he wasn't here. That guy's not worth his salt. Or another saying that she is the salt of the earth, right? It's a, it's a good thing. And especially, I, I say that about my bride. She is the salt of the earth. She is just a blessing to me. And I, I pray that all of us speak well of our, our wives, our moms, and, and the ladies in our lives. Amen. So let's talk about salt a little bit. Salt imp improves flavor. I already talked about that already. It just improves flavor. Put some salt on your food or what have you. How many can, can go with a meal without salt? Anybody in here? Wow, you guys are awesome. I don't know how you do that, but uh, I, I love salt on my steak. I love salt on my eggs. I, I just, my wife is concerned about me that I'm going to croak or something, but I, I just love the salt on, on everything. But it provides good flavor. So now here's the part for us. How does it apply to the Christian man? So when you're in a, in a circumstance and you're there, especially if it's a group of unbelievers and even if it's with your believing friends, are, are you improving the flavor of what's going on? Do you get into a situation and everybody's talking negatively and everybody is having a, a, an outlook that just isn't right and then you start maybe talking about scripture or, or thinking about, hey, you know, I had a devotion. That's what Zach said this morning. I had a devotion this morning and really encouraged me about wisdom and you salt that conversation, you salt the situation by your words or by your presence, that you improve the flavor, that it's better. And I think this is something that the Lord would call us to. Salt is also preservative. Salt is also preservative. So in Jesus' day, they would pack the fish in salt to preserve it. And so what it was, right, they would cut the heads off the fish and they gut them and they clean them all out there and then they would shove them through full of salt. There's no ice to speak of and so when they would put it on the donkeys and head it into town, the reason why the salt was there to keep the corruption from penetrating the meat. Did you hear that? So the meat is rotting and the thing that kept it from rotting was the salt, right? And salt is good. And so in your lives, what are you doing? to keep the rotting that's going on. I mean, in society, it's pretty easy, right? Just take your Bible out when you're sitting on a park bench or sitting out at your lunch during break and start reading it, and boy, you are, you are preserving what's going on just around in that area. But the enemy's after our families, men. And the enemy would want to attack our families. And so are you salt in your family? Are you keeping the corruption out? If you have teenage kids, I just pray for you guys. Because there's, there's plenty of stuff they're having to deal with, right? And that corruption comes in, whether it's from their friends and the influence that they have on that, or right through their phones as they're playing their games or doing what, and that corruption starts to penetrate your family. And you be the salt of your families as husbands, as fathers for that. So salt has a preserving quality, and we as Christian men would have to do that as well. I have a note here to remind us all that salt cannot stay in a salt shaker, right? Amen. I've seen a lot of churches where, and you know what, I'll just speak to us men here. It kind of bothers me sometimes that we get into these Christian bubbles, and I go to a Christian business, and then I go to a, a Christian event, and I go to this Christian thing, and I stay in this bubble, and I stay in this bolt, and all I see is salt shakers everywhere. The salt's got to get out of the shaker. It's got to get penetrating into the rottenness. You don't want that to rub off on you, but you have to be out in that and penetrating what's going on in this, in this corrupt world, because the enemy... Remember, we're behind enemy lines. And it's a battleground and not a playground. Now, I'm not saying don't enjoy your stuff and go to the river and, and take rides and all that. The Lord would have you be refreshed and entertained and do all things as unto Him. But there's also the battle that's going on. And the enemy's taking our, our sons out. The enemy's taking our daughters out, our wives, our families, friends that we've known for years. I think we need to get out of the salt shaker and go and penetrate that corruption 
and have an impact on this world. Salt is an antiseptic as well. It's good on wounds. Even in Ezekiel 16.4 it says, were you not rubbed with salt before you were wrapped in swaddling clothes? So they would do that with the infants. They would rub them with salt because it was an antiseptic and we're an antiseptic. So that means salt stings a little bit. You ever had a conversation and a brother looks at you and says something and you're like, ooh, I like to say amen and ouch, right? <laughs> but salt stings because it's an antiseptic. So if, if you're in a place where you're, you're in sin and a pastor shares something and as that saltiness hits you, it hits that wound and it stings a bit, but it's healing too. So you, re, you receive healing from that salt as well. This, the sting is there, right? But you're like, you know what? But now that wound's going to heal and I will get better for it. And I won't wash it all out and get all that salt out. I just, I just don't even want to hear it. Do you know, I don't even like what you're saying right now. I don't want to hear this part about my Christian life that I'm supposed to be salt to this dying world. And you force it away, you force it out of your mind, and you replace it with the busyness of work, right? You know what that word busy stands for, right? Being under Satan's yoke. I don't like that one, because I'm a busy guy. I have a lot of things I do, and I always pray that the Lord helps me stay focused on His things. So it's an antiseptic. It also creates thirst. It creates thirst. You know, I, I experience this at work because I, I don't get preachy at work, but I have my Bible out on my desk at work always, this, this Bible right here, and, and wherever I was in that morning for devotional, I have it open there, so as I'm working, I can glance down at my Bible, and go, oh, that's right, it was salt and light today, and just kind of coat that in my mind as I'm working. And people come into my office and they see my Bible. At first, it's a shock. Oh, the guy's got a Bible, what are we going to do? And they run out of there, you know. <laughs> but then they get, they do. But then, they, then what's interesting is over time, it didn't happen right away, over time, they'll come in and they'll shut the door and they'll say, Gino, I'm having a problem with my son. Or, hey, my, my wife and I are having this struggle. And so, if they open the door, work can't say anything I can talk about. It. I say, well, you know, the Bible says, and I always say that, you know, the Bible says this about your marriage, or the Bible says this about your children, or the Bible says this, because it's not Gino says this about something. Right? It's the Holy Spirit that teaches us and guides us and all that. So when I say the Bible says this, I'm, I'm confident that it's going to have an impact. And if they ask me for my opinion, I would say, you know, this is just my opinion. And I let them know that this is the Geno part, but the God part was before that, because that's what the Bible says. But it creates a thirst. And, right? Jesus was, people were drawn to him. Colossians uh, 4, 6 says this, Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt that you may know how you ought to answer each one. I love that verse. So when we speak and our lives should be such that we are salty, that people are thirsty to be with us. Are they thirsty to be with you? And if they're not, why not? Do you look more like the world than you look like Christ? Well, if we're in our word, if we're praying, if we're hanging out with the brothers, right? You can just feel the Spirit in this room. And when we're hanging out, we get filled up. And we can walk out of here salty because we've been with the salty one. And go out and create a thirst in the world. It's a dead and dying world that needs a, mes a message of faith and hope and forgiveness through Christ. Amen. And that's the important part, that we are ambassadors. Do you know that you're an ambassador for Christ Amen. when you leave this place? That you walk out of here, Holy Spirit filled, to go out and present Christ to the world. And lead in with this, the Bible says, right? Because then that's the safe part. Because when you say, you know what I think is, ooh, that's, that's the trouble. So make sure you're being thirsty. In Matthew 5, 13, 16, I wanted to go through this as well, because it has to do with saltiness as well. Matthew 5. Verses 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth. So it's very familiar. It sounds the same. But the reason I wanted to bring this up, that in the Greek, you are the salt of the earth is what Matthew writes. And it means you and you alone. It's emphatic. You are the salt of the earth. And it might feel like a great responsibility, but here's the blessing. If you know the salty one, Jesus, and he resides in your heart by the means of the Holy Spirit, you are the salt of the earth. You and you alone. But if salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned again? That sounds very familiar to this Luke passage, right? It goes on to say, it is then good for nothing. It is good for something, 
But Scripture says it's good for nothing. So it's still a purpose if you've lost your saltiness. You are good to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. It's still salt, by the way. I want us to remember that. It didn't turn into pepper. It's still salt. You haven't lost your salt, right? Because we're not going to have a conversation. We can later about losing your salvation. But you're still salt. And you've been thrown out. And now that's your purpose. To be trampled underfoot. Because you've lost your saltiness. And I think this is the part that I want to try and focus on here for a minute. You can lose your saltiness or your usefulness in the hands of the Lord. Your affect of what's going on can be lost. You're still a Christian, but now how you impact the kingdom, your duty in the battle has changed. And now you are one of those men that are potentially left behind. And you're injured, you're out of the game, you're, you're in the hole. And the rest of us look around and go, where did he go? Oh, he's lost his saltiness. But this ministry says, no, we don't leave a man behind. And we go and we get that guy. Oh, but I'm all used up and I'm using drugs and I'm sleeping with my girlfriend and I'm doing all this. Brother, back to the, come on, back to the camp. We're going to restore that saltiness. We're going to get you with the salty one, Jesus. So you don't get to be left behind and self-pity and stay in that place. Not by this ministry standard. These men, us men, will go and find you and bring you back no matter where you are so that you can be restored. But we all know people like this, right, that have lost their saltiness. They seem to have been beaten by the battle. <laughs> beaten by themselves, right? We give in to that flesh. We think, oh, maybe the promise of the enemy will be true this time, and when I look at that image, I'll be satisfied, or when I take that drink, I'll be satisfied, or I get another girl and I'll be satisfied. It never satisfies. It never satisfied. That's imitation salt. That's not the real thing. So there's some general guidelines that I've come across in ministry and like to share them with you about these, these folks that go on to the bitter end because they have five choices. They can continue in their behavior and serve as a very good, bad example. So you can go on in that behavior and just be a very good, bad example. It doesn't mean that we all point our bony fingers at you and say, oh, look at that guy. He used to be a Christian. I don't know what his story is. I don't even know if he's saved, man. He's just out there running and gunning. But you do serve as a very good, bad example. And if that's your calling, to be salt, that can be nothing more than cast out, to be trampled on underfoot, well, there you go. You can continue on in your behavior to the bitter end. You can go crazy. A few of my brothers in here know what I'm talking about now. You keep doing what you're doing, you'll keep getting what you get, and it will drive you insane. Because you'll think you got it handled, and all that happens is your life goes into that washing machine and you just tumble around until you're spun out and crazy. You can go to jail. That behavior can land you in jail. and Maybe that's what you're called to for some reason, to go to jail, to minister to those folks. I have some friends who fell hard and now serving some time and say, Gino, I, I don't believe it. I think the Lord had this in mind. He just allowed me to go through what I went through so that I could be here ministering to these folks. So I got a couple friends in prison. You could pray for them because they need some help. You could be dead. That kind of behavior, that kind of lifestyle gets people killed. I was talking, I think, to Peter this morning. I was talking about I had three friends dead by the age of 21 when I was growing up just because they were running and gunning and doing all those things. Or you can do this, you can change and repent, right? That word doesn't get said much, but I'm going to say repent. Repent of whatever it is you're doing. And that means you're going this way, now go that way towards the Lord, towards the salty one. Repent of whatever it is. Set it down. Do you know I've repented every day, every day, and I go back to it, and I go back to it. I go, All right, grab one of these brothers in here and say, hey, I'm struggling in this area. Hold me accountable and do those things. Because no man will be left behind in this ministry. Unless you want to be a Lone Ranger. How many Lone Ranger Christians in here? Oh, I'll raise my hand. 
I'd, I'll do it on my own. I'll hang drywall on the ceiling by myself. For those of you who've hanged drywall before, you know that's a crazy thing to do. <laughs> Two by four and a, a drill gun. And your head. And your head, yeah. <laughs> on a ladder. On the ladder. On the top step. That's me. But the Lord wouldn't call us to that. He calls us to relationship. And He would say, Peter, James, and John, come with me. Peter, James, and John, come with me. Let's, let's go pray. Let's go raise this person from the dead. Let's go see the transfiguration. Peter, James, and John. Where's your Peter, James, and John? You have three men in your life that you can look at and say, hold me accountable for this. Pray with me. Let us go do the work of the Lord together. Do you have three men that will do that? And if you don't, why not? The Lord did. That's how those men stayed salty because they stayed with Him. So what happened to these guys that went on to the bitter end or went crazy or went to jail or died or what have you? It happened through compromise. Ooh, we hate that word, right? Just a little compromise. Gino, you know, that, that show's not that bad. You can watch that. And he gets you by your entertainments. Oh, you know, it's a pretty good band that you're going to go listen to. It's a bar and grill. It's not really a bar. It's a bar and grill. You can go hang out there. <laughs> And it's compromise. And it's compromise. And those little compromises, and pretty soon it's like, how did I end up at Pachango? How am I here? Or maybe even worse than that, how did I end up with this room with her? Because the compromise started a little bit at a time, and pretty soon, when you were walking with the Lord here, and I just got done talking about repent, and you're all the way over here. And I just told you, repent, you're right. I need to turn from that. And go that way. So I have a couple of wrong lists. I love showing uh, my sword off to folks because I got tabs and all kinds of stuff in there. This has been a dear friend for almost 18 years. And, and I got two tabs over here. One says wrong list number two. And one says wrong list number one. We're going to go over wrong list number two. Excuse me for being direct with you guys and just using right and wrong. I don't have... Um, I love that about the Bible, right? It's black and white. It's right and wrong. It's evil and good. There's no middle ground stuff. You're either for me or against me. I love that about Scripture. You don't have to worry about the gray area. There's no gray area. You're either with Christ or you're with the enemy. You're in His camp fighting for and with Him or you're in the enemy's camp fighting against Him. That's your two choices. And I pray that we're all in the camp of Christ. So wrong list number two. Revelation chapter 21, verses 7 and 8. Revelation chapter 21, verses 7 and 8. Starts this way. He who overcomes... I'm going to stop there for a second. How many overcomers in here? Amen. Amen. Thank you for raising your hand. 1 John 5, 5 says this. Who is he who overcomes the world but... He who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. You want to be an overcomer? Amen. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God and you are an overcomer. And there's no thing or no one or nothing in this world that can stand up against Christ and Him in you because you are an overcomer. So Revelation says, He who overcomes shall inherit all things. And I will be His God. I love that part. Is Jesus your God? I just love that part. And I will be his God, right? If you're an overcomer, I will be your God is what the Lord is saying to you. And he shall be my son. Wow. I had a terrible father example here on this side. But I have a heavenly father that I can count on. And I pray someday that I will see my father in heaven. I don't know, but that's been my prayer. And he shall be my son. But the cowardly... So here comes the wrong list. The cowardly, those that run and hide because... Uh, fear, opposed to brave, right? For those of you who have been in service or been in war, you know what it, cowardliness looks like, right? You were afraid too if you were in the war. And you still charged out and completed the mission. You weren't cowardly. The fear was there like it was for all the men, yet you still went out. Same thing in the Lord's army. Whatever fear striking you about moving forward for what the mission he has for you, you need to still move out. Don't be a coward. So the list is, but the cowardly and the unbelieving. I looked this up for the unbelieving. It's suspicious and distrustful. How many of you have shared with men before and you get that idea that they don't trust what you're saying, right? And you show them, right, in Scripture. And you point out, it says, it says right here, ah, yeah, yeah, but that's written by men. I can't. It's, it's written by men, and men are flawed. You, you can't trust what that says. And that's what that unbelieving sounds like, right? 
And this is what it says in the wrong list, number two. <laughs> the abominable. And this is rendered foul. When I looked it up, it's just like it just stinks. Abom it's just foul smelling. It's rotting. It's putrid. So that's another part of it. The murderers, that seems to make sense, right? Murders make sense when it's just somebody who lies in wait and kills another person. It makes sense when it's a, a baby in the womb and it's murdered inside the womb. And those make sense too. But here's one that may not make sense to you, but I'll try to explain it. So when you have hatred in your heart, right? Jesus said it's as if you murdered is what he said. And here's, I'll be honest with you brothers, I struggle with this one. When I get fed up with you, I murder the relationship in my heart. I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to text you. I'm going to unfriend you on Facebook. And I just murder the relationship in my heart. And the Lord says that's where it starts. Yeah, murder is this outward thing, but re remember that in the Sermon on the Mount, He's talking about it's a condition of the heart. It's a condition of the heart. And I started with this, this message today with that. How is your heart? Do you have relationships in your life right now? Maybe it's a parent. Maybe it's a child. And you're so frustrated with them that you have hatred for them. And you've murdered that relationship in your heart. I'll, I'll never go back to that relationship. I don't care what she says. There's nothing he, she, or they can do to ever return into a relationship with me. And I would ask you, what if the Lord did that to me? You know how much stuff I've done to Him and to others just to satisfy my own selfish desires? Wrong list number two includes murder. Sexual immorality. Or the sexually immoral, excuse me. And that Greek word there is pornos. That's an easy one, right? Pornography, it's just rampant. Be careful with your phones. If you need accountability with pornography, grab a brother, right? Confess your sins one to another that you may be, and pray for each other that you may be healed. It doesn't say grab a bunch of people and tell a bunch of people. Just one trusted brother in this room. Say, hey, I'm struggling. My phone's a problem. My computer's a problem. It's a problem. All right, brother. Between you and me, no man left behind. I'm going to bring you along. We're going to hold you accountable. I have, I have three brothers. I have covenant eyes on my phone. And the three of us are just, right? Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John. The sexually immoral pornos. Sorcerers. Woo! Here's a good one. I love this one. Maybe just me. It's pharmakia. Pharmacy is the word we get from that drug. So sorcery or sorcerers have something to do with pharmakia or drugs. It says pertaining to magical arts, and so I'm just going to hit the one that I like speaking about, and it's pot, right? Everybody, oh, it's, hey, Gino, it's, it's medical. It's legal. it's legal. I can do it. <laughs> but here in wrong list number two, it says sorcery is something that the Lord condemns. And sorcery has something to do with pharmacy, it has something to do with drugs, it has something to do with magical arts, and that whole thing goes together. And so if you're getting stoned, it's an issue, in my view, from what the Scripture teaches us. You're a sorcerer right now. You're going to get you a robe and a cane, and you're going to walk around and do that thing. Amen. It's not allowed. should not be said of a man of God. What kind of witness is it? If you're going into one of the green-crossed buildings. Oh, yeah, I'm just going to witness these guys in here. Do you know? They, they need the Lord, too. Plus, I've got to get my stash. If you have a glass of wine and you take a drink, right? Big drink, a glass of wine. Are you drunk? Most likely not. You take a bong and you pack it and you take one giant hit off it, you think you're stoned? <coughs> well, from what I've heard from today's stuff, for sure you are. So that's my first issue with it. My second issue with it for those who talk about it being medical, what dosage are you taking? It's amazing, I woke up today and my back was hurting. And I took 600 milligrams of ibuprofen so that I could come here. It was, I had no back issue until I woke up this morning. Thanks for praying for me today, Zach. And then my back was tightening up. I'm like, Lord, what in the world? Oh, no, no man left behind. That's what's going on. But I took a dosing, 600 milligrams of ibuprofen. Medical marijuana, what dose is that you're taking? Oh, it's a dime bag dose. <laughs> Did I just give you guys an answer to tell your uh, accountability partners? 
<laughs> Sorcery. <laughs> Sorcery is on wrong list number two. Yeah. Idolatry. This is participating in any way of, worship, of worshiping immorality or unprincipledness to commit idolatry. And it ends with this one. And all liars. Any fishermen in here? Pick on the fishermen. Yeah? How big was the fish? It was this big. It was this big. And all liars. We sh our yes should be yes, our no should be no. We are men of integrity. I know that the leadership of no man would tell you guys, be men of integrity. You wear the shirt, you walk out, you're a man of integrity. And I would say because you're a follower of Christ in here, you're a man of integrity. If you say, I'm going to do it, you show up and do it. If you say, I can't make it, then you do that in love and say, I can't make it, brother. You don't make excuses. You don't have to justify your schedule. But just say, a no is no and a yes is yes. And that really goes for your teenage kids and your young kids. Let them understand what boundaries are and what it is to receive instruction. Because in all this, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So there's a serious consequence. As much as Jesus says, take me serious, whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Take this serious too, because it's the second death that comes along with it. When we're on that wrong list number two, and I have a wrong list number one, I don't have time to go through it today, but that's 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 8 through 11, for those of you who want to take notes. If you do these things that I talked about on wrong list, this is how we lose our saltiness. When I harbor hatred in my heart, when I am in bondage to drugs or pornography or to hatred to all those things, this is how we lose our saltiness. And then the unbelieving look on and says, well, if Christians are being like you, I don't have anything to do with your religion. And I will be left behind and I'll be glad with it. Because if that is what joy, happiness, and forgiveness looks like in, your li in a Christian's life, why would I even want that? I can go to Pechenia, get stoned, play some golf, and have some fun. <laughs> Wait a sec, you said golf, brother. <laughs> <laughs> You're not right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, brother. Golf's off the list. Golf's off the list. There you go. <laughs> So, so there's some golfers in here. You know why the Lord named golf, golf? Mm. Because all the other four-letter words were taken. Oh. <laughs> there you go. You started it. <laughs> so how does, how, does, how does it that we keep our saltiness? We hang out with the salty one. Amen. Yeah. 2 Timothy 3.16. <clears throat> I told you I take Scripture very seriously. I take the Lord very seriously. So in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it reads like this, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is prof profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. All Scripture. From in the beginning to the amen, all Scripture is given. God breathed is what that means. God breathed and is profitable for doctrine. Doctrine mean what's, means what's right. For reproof, that's what's not right. For correction, that's how to get it right. And for instruction, and that's how to keep it right. Amen. And that's what it's about. So stay in your word. Be with a brother who will teach the word to you. Come to hear and hear the word taught. And have it get your life right and keep it right. Because it goes on in verse 17, right? To say that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And that's the why we study Scripture. So let's finish up here quickly with uh, the lost. And actually, that was my intro, if you can believe it or not. <laughs> so I wanted to talk about this Luke 15, verses 1 through 7. Finding the lost. Verse 1 reads this way, Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. Tax collectors and sinners. So there's Jesus being salty, right? The sinners, and these are notorious sinners. It's not only just tax collectors and a few guys that are they're sinning. These are notorious guys that, are, that everyone knows that they're sinners. It's not a hidden sin. Because it goes on to say that the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. 
So he spoke to them this parable saying, and we're going to go on from there, but see, the Pharisees saw that he's hanging out with sinners. Isn't it a blessing that the Lord Jesus Christ hangs out with sinners? Because he's here with us now? A room full of sinners? And he's present. And I'm grateful, though, that's where the Lord goes. Oh, the ones that don't need the doctor? Okay, I won't go over there if they don't need healing. But those that know they have injury and wounds or whatever, although the salt is coming and it might sting a bit, those are the people I'm going to go hang out with is what the Lord would do. And the Pharisees complained about that. It tells you the condition of their heart, right? It's a heart thing. They were judgmental and hard and unyielding. And what is that rab rabbi doing? He's doing what we're not supposed to do. You don't hang out with tax collectors and sinners. That's, you're, going to, you're not going to be able to go worship in the temple because you're going to be all cruddy and, and messy with the sinners. But that's where the Lord was. And the people were drawn to him because he was salty. And having a meal with them like we did today. Eating is intimacy. Jesus goes on to say, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. Uh, this is what came to me as I was driving here today. That the Lord rejoices in the restoration. Amen. He rejoices in the restoration. Do you rejoice in the restoration? Amen. Have you had a brother who strayed? Have you strayed? And when the, the guy shows up and says, Oh man, you're at it again? I thought we talked about this. And he's one of the lost sheep. And you have that kind of attitude. And you're like, you know what? Come over here and you skin him. You hang him up. Anybody gets lost, this is what happens to him when I deal with him. I skin him alive and I'm done with him. Did the Lord do that? It says he rejoiced. He rejoiced in the restoration part of it. And this is the heart of our Lord. When sheep go astray and they get so far away from the flock that they don't know, they don't have no sense of where the flock is, you know what sheep do when they're that lost? They lay down. They lay down. They lay down and the enemy can just find them and get them, right? And they're so far away, they don't have the protection of the shepherd, they don't have the protection of the rest of the flock, they just lay down. <coughs> This is where I was at when the Lord found me. <coughs> Fatigued. Bound up in sin. Having no idea where I was going, how I was going to get there. Just f fatigued. Running and gun. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And it fatigued me. And I just laid down. I didn't care if the enemy came. I didn't care if there was no protection for my family. I was just broken. And then, see, the Lord came and found me. I didn't do anything to be found. He did the work. And then he showed up and he rejoiced. Do you hear that, man? He rejoiced when he found me. In my wretchedness, in my lostness, in my sinfulness, in my blasphemy to God, he rejoiced. Oh, I get to restore this one. Just accept, huh? there's a gospel message for you. Just accept that I will pick you up and put you on my shoulders and carry you back to the town. You don't have to do anything. I do all the work, Christ says. And I will carry you into restoration. Because you're like, you know, how am I going to do it? You let the Lord carry you. You get in your word and you read. And that word just washes over your hard heart and it softens it. And pretty soon all of a sudden it matters to you what your wife thinks and it matters to you what people think and it matters to you that you have scripture in your mind, right? I meditate on your word, Lord, so I might not sin against you. And those things become important. And the things of the world just drift away. And so this is what I believe no man left behind is part of. There are sheep out there just laying down. They have no sense of where the flock is. They have no idea what to do. And the Lord would call you to be His hands and feet and invite them to a breakfast. They get a free $7 breakfast. Come on. Bring them here. Let them be with the brotherhood. Do you sense the Spirit of God in this room? I do. And you bring a brother in who is just crushed, right? His wife's ready to leave him. His kids hate him. He lost his job and all those things is a bad country record. And you bring him and you sit him down here, brother. You have a place. You have a seat in this room. Because we were all lost once. And Jesus came rejoicing. And it, it goes on to say that in heaven there was more joy over one sinner that came to faith. 
So not only did Christ rejoice in the restoration, but heaven rejoiced for you that you came to faith in him. You gotta understand that's a truth. It's just not some word picture. It's not just some, oh, Gino's making a nice little word picture. I'm gonna walk away with angels dancing in heaven. It's a truth that angels rejoiced. And they said amen to Phil, and they said amen to Gino, and they said amen to Zach, and they said amen to that idea, and they rejoiced that you came to faith. A multitude of angels. He will be in heaven with us one day, is what they say. Amen. Singing out because of you coming to faith in Christ. And you can leave no man left behind and draw them to this chair and have them receive the forgiveness of Jesus Christ because the message was taught. I'm going to ask you all to bow your heads and close your eyes right now. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Consider where you are right now. Consider that Christ is calling you. He wants you to leave your sinful, wrongless stuff behind. He wants you to come back to Him, repent from where you are. And as I was speaking, you probably knew of a man who just lied down, fatigued from his sin, that needs to hear the message of the cross. So as you take him to church, you bring him here, you do something to be part of the battle that's going on. And we pray now, Lord Jesus, that in our hearts you would see the turmoil that's going on because of our own sin, my sin too, Lord. I pray you would forgive me as these men call out to, for forgiveness from you. Because when we confess, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all in unrighteousness. And we receive that, Lord, that we are clean now because of our confession. So may it be, Lord, that we walk out of this place, soldiers of the cross, ready to do battle. We do battle with spiritual things through prayer and through the word and through the truth of our lives and the integrity of the spirit that resides in us. So help us to be shining examples, lights on a hill, that would be drawn to us, not because of anything we have, but because of the saltiness from being with the salty one. I pray you bless this ministry and the leadership. You bless this this establishment for allowing the Word of God to be preached in here. May we all prosper. May this place prosper. And in all things, Lord Jesus, may you get the glory because your soldiers are here. Send us out. Here we are to be put into the field to do battle for you, Lord Jesus. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. And the men said, Amen. Amen. Amen.